Hey folks, Quillateen here, and welcome to another Unity programming tutorial. We're making a base building game, codename Project Porcupine, and finally, I think this is going to be the episode, assuming I haven't made any catastrophic errors, where pathfinding is actually going to be functional and finished. Now, again, uh, to try to make the, uh, the pathfinding episodes kind of coherent, I'm recording them more or less back-to-back -back on the same day, so it's entirely possible that you lovely people have discovered a bug very early on in the development process um, that I'm only going to discover basically in today's episode. So, hey, that'll be fun. The current state of things, <clears throat> we do have a, a little button here to just quickly make a little map for us that we can navigate around. And right now, that is all that is happening. Um, previously, we did have it wired that after doing this, we generated a, uh, a graph, a sort of pathfinding graph for the map. Although right now, it's not doing that on this button press. It's waiting for sort of an on-demand. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to have our character, we're going to switch the character's code around a little bit so that when we tell the character to go and build a wall over here, instead of moving directly to the tile with no pathfinding whatsoever, it's instead going to say, here's the destination tile I want to go to, and how do I get there given the current path? Because right now what's going to happen, I'm going to have to change the wall building time too, so if I click here, it'll just go straight through the wall to go over there. And that's, you know, that's by design. We knew that was going to happen. Uh, let me go and change that default job time over here. <clears throat> Um, I don't even know if this gets used. Tell you what, you know what, I'm going to get rid of that because it's too scary and inconsistent. There we go. Now it'll force this to get used here. And let's say that the job time, well, you know what? No, it's fine. We're just going to switch it to like a tenth of a second over here and that'll be fine. <clears throat> so now it'll build, uh, build walls faster. Okay. But what we want to do is we're going to focus almost entirely on the character code over here. And one of the things with the character code is that it does a ton of stuff in update and I'm not really keen on that. Um, it's trying to do too many things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this update function and break it into a little individual little bits. Um, I'm going to create a series of functions here. I think I'm going to call it update underscore whatever, whatever it's doing there. And um, I'm going to have them maybe return, return true if the update function should continue to execute or return false if we should bail out of the update at that point because, you know, we're in a state where it's like, no, no, we've, we've taken care of this transactions and you should just stop. So <clears throat> let's do a void update um, underscore um, handle job or do job. There we go. Do job over here, uh, which may or may not need a delta time. Uh, probably not. But basically all this code over here, which is all code related to the job more or less. Yeah, that's all right. We're going to grab that and move it into here. Uh, it does need a delta time. Okay, float delta time, which makes sense. And what we're going to do is call it over here and just pass it delta time. Um, and then, actually, we're going to require these to return a Boolean. If it returns true, the update function should continue to run. If it returns false, we should stop. And basically, I want that to happen here. <clears throat> so do we have a job? If yes, we grab it. We, assuming that we successfully grabbed the job, so my job is not null, then we set the jobs location, the jobs tile, as our destination tile. We register some callbacks. Uh, and then the other thing we do is we check if the current tile that our character is standing in is equal to our destination tile, then, assuming we have a job, we do some work. And then we return false to tell um, the main update function to no longer execute. So if this is equal to false, then we simply return. And that's that's the, the system I'm going to use. Um, tell the parent update function that it should stop. Return true. Tell the parent update function that it should continue to execute. <clears throat> All right. Something like that. I, I don't know. Maybe we won't do this later on, but yeah, you get the, the general idea. So that's that. Um, so that's the job handling code. If we're at the location, then we do some work. That's great. The rest of the code here is basically handling movement. So I'm going to go and make a Boolean update um, handle movement float delta time. And I think we're just going to grab all this. 
and go here. And then I guess one of the questions is, where should this be? This is where we set callbacks that a character has changed. That's probably going to be part of the movement code. Yeah, that seems reasonable. Because we move, then we tell um, our sprite system, basically, which is mostly what's listening here, that there's been a change. There's probably not a change happening here, although maybe there'll be some sort of work animation, but we'll, we'll look at that later. Uh, so with this, I guess we'll just return, we'll just return true false. Yeah, I don't like this return true false stuff. <clears throat> you know what? Let's get rid of those. No more booleans here. It feels forced and dumb. So we'll just do this. And that. And this will just be avoid. And we'll just we'll just do everything. We'll just try to make sure that each one of these functions have some sort of logic. We could use a state machine, but yeah. So first, update the job. <clears throat> then update handle movement. Or maybe do movement then to be consistent. How about that idea? And we feed it in delta time. And then that means we can just call this at the end, and that's going to be OK. Now, it does mean that unlike before, do movement will get run even before we're doing a return over here, in that if we were at a destination, we were just ending early. But what I'm going to do here is instead is a check inside of do movement if current tile is equal to dest tile then return, because obviously we're already where we mean to be, right? We're already where we want to be. Okay. So now, as is, if I try to run this, I think we will still be in a situation where our character will simply walk directly to the site and then build it in a tenth of a second now and directly pathfind over. Okay, that's still working. <clears throat> now here's what needs to change. Instead of sliding smoothly from our current tile, wherever we are, to the final destination, which is what destination tile is, instead we're going to have something like tile next tile. Uh, the next tile in the path finding sequence. And that's where we're going to differ. So if so here's, if our current tile is equal to our final destination tile, we bail out. Then we're going to say, if next tile is equal to null, or next tile is equal to current tile, then what we need to do, get the next tile from the pathfinder. So that is R in pathfinding. That's path A star. So our character... And each character in our game is going to have a some some reference to their own personal A star path that's going to happen. So our character here for next tile is going to have something like um, path A star. We'll just call it that for now. Path A star. So we go over here. We say, hey, if we don't have a next tile or our next tile is where we're already standing, we want to get the next tile from the pathfinder. First, if a star pathfinder is equal to null, <clears throat> then uh, generate a path to our destination. So say A star pathfinder equals new path A star. We have to give it a world. Do we have a copy of the world? Oh, we do have a copy of the world here. Well, that's convenient. Do we? I didn't think so, but all right. <clears throat> okay, let's let's move on. Yeah, it's in red. Nah, maybe it works. Um, <clears throat> and then the starting tile. Well, the starting tile is our current tile, and the end tile is our final destination. So this will, yeah, we don't have valid one. Calculate a path from cur to dest. Yeah, this doesn't work. Um, I guess. We can get a reference to it from current tile dot world. I guess that's fine. Now, this is a constructor, so it never returns anything. I mean, we could have it throw an exception or something like that, <clears throat> which would be fine. But what we're going to do is say something like um, public bool or er, int um, length. And we're going to have it return. First, if path 
equals null. Return zero. And otherwise, return, I mean, we could have done it as a one liner, but I like clarity for this path dot count. There we go. So we get the length of the path. So here we generate a new path. And then if path a star dot length is equal to zero, debug dot log error. Mm -hmm. Returned no path to destination. <clears throat> so we should probably do something like um, cancel job. But for now, we're just going to return. Anyway, fix me. Cancel job, maybe? Figure it out. Uh, well, I guess, I mean, we could just my job dot cancel. That doesn't actually put it back on the queue. Didn't have some other way. I don't think I have a system for just like abandoning my job and re re enqueuing it. Fix me. Job should maybe be re enqueued. I can't spell it. Enqueued instead. All right, let's get back to it. But anyway, if we're if we don't have a, a location to move to next. <clears throat> and our path a star is not a actual thing, then we will try to generate a route. Uh, if the route is length zero, then obviously this is invalid. Oh, and then we should probably just set this back to being null so that we don't, uh, we don't use it. And then we return. But at this point, at this point, we should have a valid path. Oh, that's right. So next tile is null or next tile is equal to our current tile. First, we check to see if the pathfinding system is set up, and then we, we generate a new path if need be. But grab the next uh, waypoint, or however you want to call it, from the path thing system. So at this point, we could basically say next tile is equal to path a star dot get next tile. Right, we have this function here, which just dequeues the next thing from the list. Actually, I should probably call it something like dq, because get might imply that it um, it will just get it but not change the list, but we're clearly dequeuing something. So we'll know that we're removing it from the path um, list. Now, the first one is technically should be our starting uh, tile, um, but that's okay. So we'll put in a little check for that. If, uh, if debug, if next tile, because we're, we're going to do a solution for that, um, is equal to cur tile, then debug dot log error. Let's we'll just make sure that everything is groovy. Um, okay, do movement. Uh, next tile is cur tile question mark, and we should get this the first time. Um, but let's check for it. Okay, at this point, we have a valid um, next tile to move to. And then what we do is basically use next tile instead of desk tile over here. Uh, the code is mostly going to be the same, except it's always only going to be able to, only ever going to be sliding one tile at a time. So we do that, we rename it, and then we are, um, ba -da 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 -da. Yeah, we're just doing this. Right, we don't actually change our physical position. We just say how far along we are to the next tile, and it's the responsibility of the visual system to visually represent that. We are just tracking our progress, um, how far along we are in completing the move from one tile to the other, and if our progress reaches 100%, then we set our current tile to be equal to this next tile, and the next time we loop through here, we will detect that the next tile is equal to the current tile. All right. This is feeling like, I was going to say, give me at least one, one syntax error to make myself feel better. Uh, does not contain a definition, doesn't it? Path A star has a DQ. Did I not save the file? Ah, I didn't hit save. All right. All right, hit play. Create the test. Click here. Whoa, all right. Oh! Oh, 
holy shit, I think it's working, except uh, for a glitch in our visual system. Um, because, oh, that's right. We have a function in here to get the current position of our character as a float, right over here, the X and Y. And it's lerping from our current tile to the destination based on a percentage of movement. But this is not right anymore. It should be next tile. I think it's actually working. It's freaky. Let's hit this. I think it was just returning like off X and Y's. Just was, was hurting from a visual point of view. Huh? That no, that must be a glitch from starting and stopping the run. Oh no! What? <gasps> because we're trying to use next tile. Next tile doesn't exist. Right. Um. It wasn't assigned. Yeah, next tile should probably never actually be null. And now I don't think it will be. There we go. That's looking all right. Pathfinding test. Build wall. Oh my god, you guys, 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 you guys. Holy crap, it worked! Ah, but I was gonna say, I was, I was gonna expect an error over here. What is happening here? Well, let's see. Is there a way to force a reset or things? What I suspect the problem is, very simply, that once he is standing on that tile, it is no longer a valid thing. We are getting that little error, next tile is current tile, as expected, because the very first tile that comes off our list is our current tile, is our starting tile. So we can just basically, we'll, we'll just do something to clean that up. But I think what happens here is that if we look back to the very first error that gets generated, should be, oh, I thought it was going to be the fact that the starting tile is not a valid tile, but I think it actually has to do with the fact that I am not eliminating path A star over here. Or path A star dot length is equal to zero. We regenerate it, but not only that, when we reach our destination, I should just get rid of this path A star in the first place. But this, I suppose, would also work. I mean, really, anytime we want to like stop or move it. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna create a new function here. Um, ab abandon job is what we're gonna do. A new function for that. Maybe it'll be public. Could be. So we're gonna tell a certain character to abandon a job when this happens. The first thing it's gonna do, it's gonna set um, next tile be equal to destination tile, which is equal to current tile. We're just setting everything to, like, we are now standing in the correct tile that we want to be. We are going to um, abandon any pathfinding that we had, and then we want to re enqueue this job. Because this job, we have cancel. But that's it, right? Like, what does cancel job do? What does that do for us? It cancels, it potentially calls some callbacks, which cleans things up and removes it from the visuals, but we, that's not what we're looking for. I think all we have to do is grab the job queue. Uh, so that's what? Uh, current tile dot world dot job queue dot in queue. And we're just going to put the job back on there. Back in the work queue. And then we're going to say my job is equal to null. Something like that. So that way here, we just call abandon job if for some reason we can't reach it. Okay, but the big glitch was the fact that when we get to our location here, well, it's really the fact that path A star is empty and we're still trying to read from it. And I think by putting this here, that's sufficient to to fix it, but we may as well go ahead and like abandon path A star in a few places that make sense. Right, we're there, we don't need to do any pathing anymore, everything is groovy, we're at our destination, everything is fine here. Actually, I suppose right over here. If we're at our destination, that's where we'll, we'll clear it. That's going to be fine, a nice consistent place to clear out the path A star. Okay, but I think the error will have gone away. Now there might still be one based on the fact that our starting tile is not legit, but that should actually generate an actual debug.log error somewhere. So you're going to move over there. Now I'm going to click over here. Aha! 
I think this is going to be a different error from the last time. Poop. Really? Mm, path A star line 20. Oh, that's not really where I expected. Is happening here? Oh! Oh, I don't actually check for it! Oh! I do check for it, but this check happens... I think things got moved. Hang on, let me put this near the top. There we go. Um, where do we create nodes? Oh. Right, we grab a copy. So now, I think what should happen is we should get one error that is more sensible and legible. You go there, and you go here. There we go. <clears throat> there we go. Starting tile is in the list of nodes. There, that's the bug I was trying to trigger over here. Uh, um, and then A star return no path. Then we get a bunch of other like weird errors because of, of problems, right? So the problem is that we're standing on a wall. And we're st a wall is not a tile that is walkable. So it's not, when this tile graph gets generated, it doesn't have a node for that. So I think what we have to do is we have to sort of cheat that for this path A star, we have to assume that the starting tile must be something walkable. What about the end tile? Can you end up adjacent to it or how does that work? Because like I keep thinking something like prison architect, your characters actually end up standing on things to work on them, which is what we have so far. But it does look a little bit derpy, and it might be more sensible if, like Dwarf Fortress and Rimworld instead, characters stand next to things to work on them, which will ensure they're always standing on a legal tile. That's sort of a gameplay question more than anything else. Um, so, and, and it affects, so in the Prison Architect style, start and end tiles will always be valid, walkable. And technically, walls are walkable tiles in Prison Architect. You're not forbidden from standing on walls. It's just, I think the pathfinding system basically weights them so highly that the characters will always just path around them. But they're not actually technically forbidden from walking on there. And every now and again, there's gonna be some weird stuff, like some of the fighting animations. I think you can like sort of fight and after you punch, people sort of like fly backwards a little bit. And I think it's possible to sort of fly backwards through a wall when that happens. And that's okay in, in the sort of Prison Architect physics system. Um, and yeah, because the workers go and stand on things, that has an impact over there. But right now, I mean, there's nothing in our sort of physics system that prevents our character from walking through a wall, but the problem is that they can, if they've just built a wall and they're standing on a wall, that wall is not in our list of nodes. I think for now, what we're going to do, um, right, right now, we're going to manually add the start tile into the list of valid nodes-ish. Damn. Actually, here's what we could do. One way to solve this would be, and this is probably the most elegant way to solve it, in the, the tile graph. This is what determines what nodes get added or what don't. Right now, we only add them if the movement cost is above zero. Let's change this. Let's always add them in, but I was going to say, set the movement to infinity. Or set the cost to infinity. Which wouldn't happen here. Actually, I guess it could be in the, oops, not reference, in the tile code itself. The whole thing is a tile code returns a movement cost. I'm saying if it has a movement cost of zero, 
it's unwalkable. Now, that could still be true for an empty tile, but maybe for a wall instead. So for furniture, maybe we return like infinity. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? Let's add all nodes over here. And what we'll have to do is a special case, I guess, in the pathfinding, because obviously a cost of zero is no good. Um, oh, we're not actually using the movement cost at all over here, are we? No! Oh, yeah! Huh. Because so far we're assuming, basically with this system, we're treating all tiles as having a cost of, of one or being literally unwalkable. Um, but I guess it's this, this distance from the current to the neighbor. This here should actually be multiplied based on the movement cost. So we'll have distance between B, the real thing, multiplied by current, uh, or no, because this is the cost to enter the neighbor. Neighbor dot data dot movement cost. And I'm going to put a ternary, tertiary, ternary, ternary, I think, operator here, is if the movement cost, hmm. Float movement cost to neighbor. You just put on different lines so it's a bit more um, clear. Is going to be okay. The neighbor dot data dot movement cost. If it's equal to zero, then the cost will be mathf dot infinity. It's not literally impossible although yeah ah shit because now yeah it, you will always try to path around it but technically they will if need be walk through the infinity tile okay this is a shitty solution i'm sorry you guys uh we do need to still do the movement cost though um oh i guess it's the neighbors oh all right i have it okay so the movement cost the neighbor is the neighbor.data.movementCost um, multiplied by the distance, like that. And then we add that in. OK. So it's the distance between the two tiles multiplied by the movement cost to enter, enter that neighbor tile. That's going to be fine. OK, so all the code is groovy right now. Um, in the graph, we are going to add all tiles in there. The difference will be this. can't believe it hadn't occurred to me yet is for pathfinding purposes, our neighbors, we should ignore neighbors that have an infinite cost or a cost of zero. So, where do we get the actual neighbors? Get neighbors. That's in this code here. No, it's not here. It must be in here. There it is. Okay, we get neighbors. And what we're going to do is we're just not going to create an edge. That's it. So we are going to add all tiles to the database. And we're not going to have to deal with math infinity. We're simply just not going to create an edge between two tiles if the target tile is unwalkable. But that means we can still exit a wall. If we're stuck in a wall, we'll still be able to exit it because we will still have edges leading out from the wall. It's just there won't be any edges leading into the wall. Ah, sorry, I should have thought of that sooner. So, um, oh, we already do that. We already don't create this edge. We actually had a certain amount of um, redundancy. So now there's gonna be a lot more nodes created. But there won't necessarily be that many more edges. Actually, there will be a lot of edges created too. So let me hit this and ask for a wall to get built over here. Oh, that takes a long time to process. 
Is it running over and over again? Whoa, my poor computer. Okie dokie. Fix the problem. So uh, it was twofold. First of all, um, so by adding this, what was happening is that all our tiles at the edge of the map were making calls to get tile at with an invalid tile, right? One that was out of bounds, which is totally fine. The problem is because we're having so many of them, each one of which, uh, each out of bounds call was doing a debug.log error. And anytime you spam a bunch of stuff to the debug log in Unity, your program slows down dramatically. So each edge tile was spinning out um, one of these errors and flooding the log, which is why things went really, really slowly. Um, and it was doing that, I think, because it was failing to find a path or something, I'm not sure. It was returning, uh, it was trying that every frame and everything just uh, went to a crawl. We actually did discover a bug here though, um, because with this disabled, what we had, the code was like this. So I disabled this and then I hit play. And then I hit build wall over here and we got some errors. I was like, that's odd. What what errors am I still getting? And the errors were that the array index was out of range. And it's because I was missing an equal here. The out of range values are if X are greater or equal to width and Y is greater or equal to height. So we were still running this with invalid values. But by putting in that little change, now we're in a situation where I work. We still get the one error of next tile is current tile, which we anticipated. We've built the wall. And now if I click over here, it works because there are edges leading out from these walls, but not back in. So if I click over here, he should not walk through this wall. He should walk around it because there's no edge leading into the wall, but there is an edge leading out. So there we go. So our, um, our graph is a little bigger because it does create 10,000 nodes. It does create one node for literally every single tile in the game, but it still happens really quickly. And you've got to remember every single time a wall gets built here, it invalidates the previous graph. And then when I click, it regenerates a whole new graph again. And right now, regenerating the graph is much, much more involved than the actual pathfinding. Now, if I click over here, what happens? Nothing! We cannot reach that over there. It's going to generate lots and lots of errors, which is the point. Um, but that tile over there is unreachable because there's no floor. I suppose I could, I should be able to make it reachable, actually. Let's see. If I go and build a little bit of floor here, like that, and then ask you to build a wall over here, now you can reach! Excellent! Now, right now, if I bulldoze this, nothing will change because it still has its current path locked in. We'll probably want to do something where we invalidate, um, not just, so right now we do invalidate graphs when, um, um, when uh, the map changes, but we don't invalidate active pathfinding. So that's why it didn't kill that. Yeah, and then we get tons of errors, which uh, probably will want to bail out. Well, I guess what's happening here is that we bail out. There's no path to destination. So then we bail out of our efforts. We abandon the job. We set our path to zero to null, but then we're putting the job back on the queue and our character then immediately grabs the same job because right now we don't have anything that checks that when you grab a job from the queue, we don't check to see if we can actually reach that job. It's also worth noting. We don't currently check the distance to the job for priority. We just grab the oldest job which for now is sufficient, but soon we will want our characters to act a bit more intelligently and work the job that is nearest to them. It's going to be a job that's nearest to them and is actually reachable. For now, most likely we will use the pathfinding system for this um, because there's not going to be that many jobs and that many characters. So it's actually going to be quite easy for us to, to look through. Now, do we want to look through the entire job list to literally find the closest? Uh, do we want to use a Dijkstra map? Do we want to just cheat in a variety of ways? I don't know. Maybe for now we'll have them keep doing the, the oldest job in the queue, but we'll make sure that the job is actually reachable right away, which we could check, right? Right now we run the pathfinding immediately or sorry not immediately we run the pathfinding when it's time to actually do the move but what we could do here yeah, check to see if the job is reachable right and then maybe we um if it's not we put the job at the bottom end of the pile and then do the next one it's something of that nature there's, there's a bunch of different ways to work it right now i'm just gonna put in a to do because we have to put a cut in this episode. Thank you very much for watching. I am actually surprised at how well the pathfinding system is working. I'm still a little bit nervous that there's some like deep seated weird bug that, you know, is going to crop up and destroy us and melt the universe. Um, but yeah, it is technically there. We can, uh, we can trap our dude actually, if we do something like this and like that.
Here, let me actually reset you so you don't have to walk quite as far. We should make him move faster. Feels way too sluggish, doesn't he? But if we tell you to do something like this, oh, build a wall. Like this, that, 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 that. And then put one in the middle. <laughs> It'll be stuck. Bug or feature? You tell me. Certainly, it's possible to trap dwarves like that uh, pretty frequently. And I guess in every one of these games, it's entirely possible to trap your people in somewhere. To me, that's probably fine. Um, you know, you'll have to build things in a slightly different order. Someone else will have to come over and um, help destroy the wall. I suppose one of the things you can do is once we, if we change the code so that you can do some work being adjacent to something, it's possible that what we could do is set a job. Um, so once we do this, right, and we got, and he's stuck in the middle, um, I could maybe bulldoze down this wall as a job and maybe he'll be able to do that because he'll be adjacent or, or some damn thing like that. We'll obviously be tuning these behaviors just a bit. Um, because what does it mean to take down, take apart a wall? Are we going to want the person to climb on top of the wall and then take it out that way? I don't think so. I think adjacency is the way to go. And in fact, I strongly suspect that going forward, even with building a wall, we're going to want them to just stop adjacent to the wall. But by leaving this, this behavior where we stand on top of things is actually allowing us to find some funny little edge cases and different things like that. I think we're going to want to do standing next to the job site, um, going forward. And an easy way to do that. A very easy way to do that is um, make it so that instead of waiting for working the job until our current tile is the destination tile, make it so that um, it's if there's only one more tile on the queue, right? When we are one tile away from ending, the only thing left on the queue is obviously going to be um, the the target, right? I mean, we can do that now. Yeah. Instead, if we go if um, a star, what's it called? Path a star dot length is equal to one. We are adjacent to the job site. Do work. And then same thing over here. Um, Over here, what? If length is equal to one, then return. I mean, it's not quite accurate because sometimes we do want to stand on the tile, right? Sometimes we will. But as for the sake of argument, for the sake of argument in this case, If I do this, oh, we're getting lots of errors of what we're getting. Oh, um, if not equals null and that, I think that would have gone away as soon as I gave him a job, but oh, that's not quite right either. Anyway, we can figure something out. Like there, there's a bunch of different ways to make the adjacency rule work. Um, I'm gonna go and remove this because it's obviously derpy, and remove this because it's obviously derpy. And right now we will continue to do the thing where we stand on stuff to get them built. And then we'll figure out exactly how we want the adjacency to work. Can you work on a job diagonally? I don't know. What do we want? Is that what we want? Could be. And they'll always work on these jobs from bottom left if you assign them that way. We can do this. Whoa, oh. Yeah. Oh, because it bails out of that. Oh, that's really interesting. Anyway, I'm going to wrap this up. I I've clearly don't have a plan anymore, and I'm just like semi amazed at the things that have gone bad. Or, well, I'm amazed at the things that have gone well and amazed at the things that have gone bad. It's been a long day of programming, trying to get all the pathfinding videos done in one go to try to have some sort of coherency there. And I've now reached that point where I'm utterly incoherent. I don't know what the next thing in the queue is going to be for us. It might be uh, cleaning up the pathfinding a little bit more for this adjacency behavior. Uh, clearly, there's a little bit of, of wonkiness that I've left the, uh, the code in a state. So probably there'll be a little bit of cleanup of that. But after that, I don't know. I mean, if we really want to go and, and break what we've just done, 
I suppose the next thing to do might be to implement doors. I don't know. I do want to put in a note, a few people have been sending me some updated graphics uh, for the game. If you yourself had um, plans for sending, you know, new versions of, of walls and floors, uh, please do so. The best way to do it is probably to email me um, and make sure that you've got like Project Porcupine in the title or maybe Project Porcupine graphics. Uh, just something like that. That way it'll be easy for me to like you know, control F and find it in my email later on when I'm trying to do it. Uh, do keep in mind, it's a little tricksy. Some of the people that have sent me the graphics, um, there's like little seams and things that come up over here. So if possible, see if you can test it in Unity and make sure that everything is properly seamless if possible. It doesn't have to be 32 pixels uh, per tile, um, although I probably wouldn't go any bigger than say 64 pixels per tile uh, because after that, um, most of the time the tiles are just gonna be too small on screen to really get that detail and they'll just sort of get fl blurry and fuzzy and it really won't pay off. Plus it does use a little bit, you know, it's a little bit extra work to render. So, um, but if you do got that, go ahead and email it to me. Um, that'll be fine. I'm, oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize I had, how long has this been misspelled? Count trollers. Um, someone in the comments is rejoicing that I've just fixed that. Um, yeah. Oh, my email address is quill18 at quill18.com. Should be really easy to find. Thanks for watching folks. I'll see you next time. Thank you very much to all our January supporters over at patreon.com slash Willie King Creates and these mic check supporters. We've got Alexander Gutler, Andre Odendal, Neil Blakely Milner, Speedy Savant, Valiant Cake Fiend, Aaron Toyson, Marius Field Vold, Disco Geek, Ole Peter Talgo, Julian Auger Lafont, or Auger Lafont, I should say, Steven Stagger, Michael McClintock, Kale the Quick, Drazion, Wes Oldenboving, Craig Mortel, Nail or Nale, I don't know, Vickstrom, and Andrew Henninger, and everyone who has watched, shared, favorited, and subscribed to these videos, and left comments as well. You guys really keep things going. Thank you very much for watching.